Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, welcome. Bienvenido. It's a great honor and a pleasure to see you all here for this incredible and incredibly unusual event. My name is Daniel Canstrom. I'm a professor of law here at BC. I also currently serve as faculty director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy and as a co-director of the um, Center for Human Rights and International Justice, together with my colleague Brenton Likes, who is here. Um, we're here tonight to celebrate, but also to challenge each other. Our celebration is both very special and very complicated. First, we're here to celebrate a very difficult legal victory, very technical, a victory that was in many ways against all the odds. After years of incredibly difficult and complicated legal work, we've returned a person, a lawful permanent resident of the United States, who came here as a child, Mr. Vilmer Garcia, back to his home and his family in the United States. As you will hear, Mr. Garcia was deported due to an extremely minor infraction. He has endured deep injustice and unfairness, harsh detention, the deep pain of family separation, and many, many years of unlawful banishment to Honduras. You'll hear some details of the legal case from the outstanding legal team that worked together on Vilma's behalf from Boston College, from the law firm of Nixon Peabody. You know, they say that it, it takes a village to raise a child. It seems that it took more than a village, and actually now I'm thinking it's taken generations of villagers to, to just handle this one case. Um, two of these people, at least two of them, I'm proud to say were graduates of Boston College Law School. Um, <clears throat> our hope is that these presentations will inspire others here, especially law teachers and especially law students, to see that such victories are in fact possible if you're willing to fight long and hard and creatively enough. We're also here to celebrate some other things. First and most important, we will hear from Mr. Garcia himself and you will experience what we have experienced in years of working with him. That this is a very special man, a person of great courage and optimism with a deep commitment to justice and to his family. We celebrate his indomitable human spirit and the privilege that it's been for us to work with him and his family, many of whom are also here as our guests tonight. So we welcome you all here. We also celebrate some joy and some satisfaction in striking a meaningful blow against a large unjust system that has taken root in our country for more than a quarter century now. This is the challenge part. As we gather here tonight, tens of thousands of people are still in immigration detention in this country, facing deportation. They're caught in a system that I've described many times as a radical social experiment that's unprecedented in history and unique among constitutional democracies in its disregard of basic fairness, its disregard of family ties, its disregard of proportionality, and its disregard of fundamental respect for human dignity. It's a very big system, budgets of more than $20 billion per year. The total number of people apprehended by U.S. immigration agents has averaged over 600,000 people per year since 2010. From 1987 till 2016, some 34 million people were expelled from the United States, either through formal removal proceedings or through voluntary departures, so-called. Interior deportations alone have increased in the United States from some 23,000 in 1985 to over 340,000 in 2016. But it's a huge system, and we're talking about one person, and we're here to celebrate a victory for one single human life. But there's more, obviously, at stake in, in how we view this system. It's remarkable, actually, to me, it's always remarkable to me, how when I speak to audiences, of US citizens, mostly, people are just generally unaware of the size of this system and the scope of it and the force of it, given its size and given its dreadful effects. That's really peculiar. But we know that those who have felt it, like Mr. Garcia's family and like millions of other immigrants in this country, know only too well what we're talking about here. At the very least, it is clear that the US deportation system needs deep reform and powerful restraint by human rights principles. 
Now, I'm a lawyer who's represented many people facing deportation over many years. And so the harshness, the unforgiving nature of deportation, the terror of lifetime banishment for minor offenses was well known to me. But I began to be particularly offended by something a little more specific, and that was the government's position that even wrongful deportations, even those that were mistakes or were procedurally defective, might never be reviewed by any judge or any court. My frustration and my anger about this led me, together with my colleagues at the Center for Human Rights, to start this post-deportation human rights project um, more than a decade ago. I think it was about 57 years ago, <laughs> if I remember correctly. We first called it the Ruby Slippers Project after the moment in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy clicks her heels together and wistfully says, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. And that worked pretty well uh, for a while. We had ruby slippers all over the place. We had ruby slippers mugs and uh, posters and pictures of Judy Garland and all that. And, uh, but then, as uh, Rachel Rosenblum, our first staff attorney, will remember well, this was a cultural reference that did actually not work very well for many in the communities where we sought to work um, with the deported. In particular, when translated into Khmer, the language of the Cambodian community in Lowell, we were told that it translated as the Red Shoes Project, which made people think we were communists and therefore they were somewhat skeptical of working with us. <laughs> so now it's the less culturally interesting, less, somewhat less resonant, but more precise post-deportation human rights project that we have. I do still have some Ruby Slippers mugs though, and uh, maybe we can distribute them in some way as we wrap up the project. Our mission statement for this project says that the post-deportation human rights project was designed to address the harsh effects of current U.S. deportation policies. The project, first of all, aimed to conceptualize what was then, and in many respects still is now, uh, a new area of law, post-deportation law. We also aim to promote the rights of the deported and their family members through research, policy analysis, human rights advocacy, and training programs. The ultimate aim of the project has been to advocate, and we put this in the original mission statement, in collaboration with affected families and communities for fundamental changes that would introduce proportionality, compassion, fairness, and respect for family unity into U.S. immigration laws, and to try to bring these laws into compliance with international human rights standards. That was the goal. So this leads me to the last couple of things that I, I think we're here to celebrate, which were also founding features of our center and of our post-deportation project. First, we want to show our students the joys and the value of collaborative work and of participatory action research. We've get engaged over the years with many community organizations and activists in Boston, Chelsea, East Boston, Providence, to Jamaica, Cambodia, the Azores, Geneva, Mexico, and Zacualpa, Guatemala. Also, we always believed in the essential importance of interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary human rights work. And I think that as you hear the presentations tonight, you'll see the importance of that approach. It's not just a question of law that we're talking about. It's, it, there are many questions uh, within this project. So you'll hear more about all of that tonight. I said I was going to speak briefly, and, and I mean it, because uh, our next speaker is, I think, going to be a, a real highlight of um, actually the last 10 years for me and maybe for you too. So let me conclude by just restating my pride and my joy and my humility in being here with you tonight as I turn to our amazing client, Mr. Vilmar Garcia, to tell you his story of exile and of return. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being out here tonight. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to be here today. First of all, I want to give thanks to the Lord. Without him, none of this would have been possible. Also, I want to give thanks to my family, my wife, and the most amazing, incredible legal team that stood there. Can you guys hear me? That stood there 
for me throughout this long, hard process, which I will always be beyond grateful, especially Nixon Peabody and Boston College. You will always be in my heart and prayers. I want to start by letting you know that what I'm about to talk about is 15 plus years of life events cut down to 15 minutes, so I'll be as brief as possible. I was born in Honduras in 1982. I came to the United States when I was 10 with my mom, dad, and my sister as a legal permanent resident. At first, we lived with my uncle family for, uh, after four years by, uh, from living with my uh, uncle's family, my parents were able to buy a house in Kenner, where we still live today. Kenner is about 10 minutes away from the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. I pretty much grew up in Kenner. I went to elementary, middle school, and graduated high school there. I remember I had a great childhood. I learned how to ride a bicycle, how to drive a car, how to play football and basketball. That's why I consider Kenner as my hometown. My family is a very close bound of family, a very extended family. We will get together and celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, and even just to get together at the park and do some barbecue. After I graduated high school in 2002, I wanted to join the Marines, but that didn't work out. I started going out clubbing. I was young and naive and started hanging out with the wrong people and eventually started using ecstasy. I got arrested just a couple of months after I started going out clubbing and started doing ecstasy. I hired an attorney to represent me during my criminal defense. And he worked out a plea deal with the court and instead of doing time in prison, I was put in probation for, for two years and also paid court fees. One thing that I know now that I was unaware of before is that by, pleading, by me pleading guilty to a drug charge, this will automatically put me on the loop for deportation. Eventually, because of that guilty <coughs> plea, I was arrested by Immigration and Customs Enforcement and put into removal proceeding. I was detained in Orleans Parish Prison in New Orleans. I remember when I was locked up in prison, I had my immigration court through a television. Previously, my immigration lawyer, with the help of a criminal lawyer while I was in detention, they tried to overturn my single possession of ecstasy for something less harmful for immigration purposes. They even applied for a pardon, and it was granted. But unfortunately, they couldn't overturn the possession of ecstasy charge. According to my lawyer, that was the only opportunity I had. Unfortunately, back then, the immigration judge agreed that my conviction of simple possession of ecstasy was an aggravated felony for drug trafficking. Let me tell you something. Aggravated felony is the worst charge an immigrant can have. The immigration judge, as well as my immigration lawyer, told me that I had no defense to deportation. In other words, that was a dead end for me as a lawful permanent resident. As you can see, I was granted a first offender pardon under the state of Louisiana. And because of that same charge, I was again charged by immigration. But this time, it was basically a life sentence. A mistake that I made and that I paid for it and that I learned from it. The immigration judge ordered me deported to Honduras, a place where I had only visited a couple of times as a child since I moved out to United States as a green card holder. A place where I never ever thought I, I would be back to live. But I was still locked up in prison for many more months after I was ordered deported 
in total, I was detained about nine months. It was a very traumatic experience. I had never been separated from my parents. I went through Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans prison. It was a nightmare. We were left out there in our cells to die, basically. With no food, no water, no ventilation, no nothing. We were rescued out of there after five long days, but all of this I'll talk more when I finish writing my book. I'll be writing about everything I went through, every detail, which God's willing, I'll finish next year. Right before I was deported, about nine months after I was arrested by Immigration and Custom Enforcement back at home, right before I got on that plane, handcuffed all around me, my waist, ankles, like a hardcore criminal, an immigration agent told me, Mr. Garcia, do you understand that you are being deported for life? You can never come back, not even for your parents' funeral. And if you do come back, you are looking at a maximum 20 years in a federal prison. That was like a burning knife going through my heart. I was heartbroken. I was devastated. When I arrived in Honduras in November 2005, my first year was very, very hard. I went through depression. I was lost. I had no friends. I didn't really know how to get around. Most of my family were in the United States. Most of my life I have lived in the United States. I really couldn't speak Spanish well. I mean, I only got to second grade before I moved to the United States. Let me tell you a couple of things about Honduras. Honduras is considered as one of the most violent countries in the world. Corruption is everywhere. Poverty is overwhelming, more than 60%. There's so little opportunities of employment. It has one of the highest murder rates in the world. It's a jungle out there. I couldn't adapt to being out there by myself. I actually had suicide thoughts. But in the middle of the storm on my first year after being deported, I met my beautiful wife, Anna Maria. I found her just in time. Who knows what would have been of my life if I had not found her. I had three beautiful boys with her and she was a big influence for me to get closer to God. Roughly five years after my deportation, I had a visit from a family member that I have not seen since I was deported. We talk about everything. He asked me about my hopes to return back to the U.S. Previously, my parents had consulted an immigration lawyer to find out if I had any hopes to return back home in the United States. They went twice throughout those five years, and both times they told them that first they would have to become a U.S. citizen, and after 10 years of me being deported, they could petition for me. That was a big lie. We actually had our hopes on because this is coming from an immigration lawyer. But let's be honest, being an aggravated felony, that is just not possible. But I didn't know that until Ms. Jessica Chico explained me that. Anyway, my uncle tells me, Wilmer, you understand English. You know how to use the computer. You should look around and see if there's if there's another way to return back legally, that automatically triggered my determination to search for any hopes to go back home in New Orleans. I was searching around the internet when I came across the Lopez case. It was evening. Lopez case is also about drug possession charge, where immigration was mistakenly ruling as a drug trafficking conviction, therefore an aggravated felony. His case made it all the way to the Supreme Court and won by anonymous decision. While I was reading the article, I felt identified by his case, and at the bottom of the article, they, they had three telephone numbers, and it stated that if you or anyone you know 
to call, uh, have ever gone through this, to call the following three numbers. So on the next day, I dialed the first number. There was no answer. I called the second number. I got a hold of Trina Riomoto at National Immigration Projects of National Lawyer Guild, and eventually she got me in touch with Jessica Chico and Professor Dan at Post Deportation Human Rights Project at Boston College. On the next 90 days, we had to come up with a game plan before those 90 days. We filed a motion to reopen because mine was wrongfully decided. I should have been entitled to present a claim for cancellation of removal. It was hard. It was really hard. But we got the job done on time, thanks God. I remember it was quickly denied by the immigration judge. According to the immigration judge, he didn't have jurisdiction because, because I was no longer in the US. Therefore, I was barred from filing a motion to reopen. We appealed that decision, and it was also denied by the Board of Immigration Appeal. And we appealed that decision, of course, and then it was time to go up to the Fifth Circuit Court. That's when Ms. Jessica Chico told me that we needed to get help from the expert, and they reached out to Ronaldo at Nixon Peabody. May God bless him and everyone at Nixon Peabody greatly. Amazingly, for the first time after two years, we saw some lights at the end of the tunnel. The Fifth Circuit had just overturned the departure bar. We won that day. And with this victory, they can't deny us that even though after I had been deported and in Honduras soil, I still had a right as a legal permanent resident. So the Fifth Circuit Court remanded our case back to the immigration judge, but that doesn't mean the immigration judge is going to grant our motion to reopen. And he didn't for many reasons. After that, it was a back and forth battle between the courts. We won some and we lost some. But at the end of the day, together as a team, we were able to achieve what most will say almost impossible. We beat all the odds. The Board of Immigration Appeal had decided to reopen my case. Immigration Appeal, uh, Immigration appeals that decision, of course, but the Board of Immigration Appeal denied their appeal. Finally, I was going to get my day in court. Now, it was my opportunity to present my claim that I was wrongfully denied to in the first place. My lawyer had to get the U.S. government to bring me back to the United States to present my case. Now, the time for me to return back home was just around the corner. Again, that was incredible teamwork. There were last minute adjustments that needed to be made, but my lawyers made it possible. I had them all working throughout the last weekend before I traveled back to the United States. My relationship with my legal team is outstanding. I'm always in touch with them. They have been very professional with me and my family. They are the perfect example of how an attorney should be. They are amazing. But best of all, they believe in me. I thank God for putting them in my path. They never gave up on me. I am beyond grateful for each one of them. Now, I wasn't coming as a free man just yet. I was coming to detention, in prison, to keep on fighting my case. I was mentally prepared. I was ready. In my mind, I had prepared to be detained for at least two years. I was just happy to be back home. Once in the US, even for the prison picture, I had a big smile on my face. <laughs> My lawyers had been getting me prepared for immigration court. I was ready. I knew we were going to walk out of here with the victory. My lawyers, they were determined that they would do everything on their power and give their best, and that I wouldn't just get deported back to Honduras just like that. 
And that's why I say earlier, I was mentally and emotionally prepared for a good long vacations in, in detention. <laughs> for our court date with Judge Duck, we were all nervous. We were worried that two and a half hour court time just might not be enough, given the fact that there were overwhelming evidence to present to the court. And believe it or not, it just lasts approximately five minutes. It was amazing. It was incredible. I broke down to tears of happiness. I was speechless. I, I can't find words to describe the satisfaction that I felt after fighting for so long, after dreaming about it for so long, we finally did it. It was a super special moment that every time I talk about it or think about it, it gives me goosebumps all the time. I look at my lawyers and they have an ear-to-ear -ear smile and bright eyes of happiness. Deep inside, they were crying of joy. <laughs> it is a dream come true. It is a great blessing to be here. I have so much to be grateful for. I have become more humble than I ever been. Thank you so much and may God bless, bless all of you. Thank you. Friedman, um, and perhaps even more difficult than telling a life story in 15 minutes, as Wilmer did so beautifully, is to limit the questions that we have for him to only 10 minutes. So we're going to start out now by having a 10-minute question and answer period for Wilmer, and then he'll be back here at the end of the panel with all of the other panelists for more question and answer at the end of the, the program. Wilmer, would you mind coming over here where the audio is a little bit better um, for the question and answer? And um, I will be moderating the question and answer. So any people who have any questions for Wilmer about his experiences, uh, what it was like to be a client, how he, how he found PDHRP, um, he explained a little bit about that, what it was like in detention, and any, anything that you'd like to know about his experience in Honduras um, or the, going through this, working with us. Over there. And if you can't hear it, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Okay. Um, hi, I am a student um, at Boston College. I'm from Ecuador, um, so also Latin American. And I just would like to ask, um, what um, gave you hope in this process? Because it seems like a very long and tough process. And I, I am maybe sure, like wondering if you wanted to just give up and just like say, oh, I want to like, I'm going to stay in Honduras. I'm not going back uh, home. But I just would like to know what was the source of your hope and like okay. more about that. Um, just want to let you know that I have a hearing problem. And if you can repeat that question. I'll repeat it for you. She's going to know what gave you hope during the long battle. If I lost my hope. Then... How you kept your hope? How? That's a good question. <laughs> Actually, in the Bible it says that if you ask in the name of Jesus Christ and you don't doubt about it, it's going to happen. So I never doubt about it. Not even for a sec. As an attorney who was in communication with him almost daily for about a year, I can attest to this fact. I'd be on the phone and I'd be all stressed out. I'd be like, you know, what about this? And have you thought about that? And he'd say, Heather, it's all going to work out. I know it's all going to work out. And I'd give him, I'd give him, I, you know, we were for the, a while, you'll hear about later, we were um, negotiating with the, with the government for his return. And at, at a certain point, we, we were hoping that he'd be able to come not detained. We thought that actually that that was his legal right to not be detained upon return to the United States. It became clear that the government was going to oppose us at every point. And so we had to break the news to him that he was only going to come back as a detained individual and he had had a really horrendous experience in detention and um, when I broke that news to him you know he did react with some emotion but what did you say <laughs> it's all gonna work out Heather it's all gonna work out um, so 
anyway, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was profoundly um, hope inspiring for me to work with somebody who really had that, that, that incredible faith in the, good, in the goodness of people as well as his religious faith. It only take. I asked many times, and I put it in writing because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Any other questions? So I might ask you a couple of questions. So, oh, oh, please, oh. Uh -huh. Was your wife able and children able to come back? Were your wife and children able to come back? Are your wife and children here with you now? They are not. Actually, thanks goodness that Nixon Peabody is helping me uh, and completed the petition for my family. And right now, we are in the waiting period for them to come here. Can't wait to have them here. For those of you who are not immigration attorneys, um, we filed the visa petition. And for a lawful permanent resident, there's, um, there's, there's a waiting period. And so he has about, we, we looked, we checked it today. It looks about approximately a year and a half before his family can do the paperwork from Honduras. <clears throat> Other questions? In the back? Um, so you had mentioned that you were able to do some research and uh, look at Supreme Court cases from Honduras. I'm wondering whether there's any of those resources available to folks in detention. Are there any libraries or computers that one can access just on their own to, to look into their own case or find resources that might be available for them? Did you hear that? Um, so she said that when you were back in Honduras, you went on the computer and you found the Lopez case. When you were in detention, did you have access to a computer to do any to books, to the library, to do legal research, or did you hear anything about that? Both times you were in detention, any way to do that kind of legal research? Uh, before my deportation, no, no access to computer. They only had books that are like twenty years old books. And uh, when I came back, there, there were, you know, uh, access to computers, but you have to ask uh, a permission. And it, it, it take them like a month for them to answer you. So, I, I, you know, I, I filed a petition to use the computer, but before they called me, I was already out. Other questions? There was a great question. Um, I don't know if there's, there's quite a few immigration attorneys here in the room today. Some of you might have been people who have looked at detention standards. So under the Obama administration, there was an, um, a, a, a revamp of the sort of policy standards that some detentions were required to uh, contractually adhere to. But these, um, there, there was very little enforcement mechanism. Um, and I think that that has gotten, you know, there's little to no enforcement of those standards. They were more aspirational than anything else, and they address everything from access to legal materials to, um, you know, to food, to medical, uh, access to medical care. And so that is definitely a huge problem in our detention system, which is also, as Dan mentions and as he writes about a lot in his work, uh, increasingly privatized and for profit. Other questions in the back? Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm not a, a lawyer, but I wonder, what would you say to the many people, some of whom I do encounter, work with, and so on, who uh, don't speak English as well as you do, you know, and are, live in fear of deportation or are in that process, and might be deported back to Honduras, Guatemala, um, El Salvador. What would you say, what can I say to them that you are saying? Thank you. That was a great question. What I would say is do never lose hopes. Always search your way to do it the right way and always pray for it. Read the Bible because if you believe it and and you confess on the name of Jesus Christ, you believe it's going to happen. This is, this is not a maybe. This, this is going to happen. Um, and if there's not a, another question, oh, there's a question in the front. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Ariana. Um, I had a question about you returning to Honduras and what was that experience like having never been in that country before, or not recalling what it was like to live there? And what were some of the challenges that you, you said you struggled a lot the first year? Could you give us some examples of what that experience was like? She's interested in knowing about the difficulties you had in Honduras. If you could talk about what that was like to return to Honduras, a country you didn't know well, and what problems you had. Thank you. That was a great question. Just imagine, we all had nightmares sometime in our life. Just imagine being in a, in a nightmare and you're not able to wake up. And as much as you want to wake up, but it's reality. And it's, it's overwhelming. But you cannot let that eat you. It almost did to me, but I got on my knees and I asked for guidance through Jesus. And like I say, I mean, people have to believe that anything is possible. Wil Wilmer, can I ask you a couple of questions on this topic? You told me about some of the difficulties you had in finding work. Can you explain to them what kind of work you did do and what you were able to find even with your wonderful English skills, how difficult it was to find a full-time job? Well, um, when I got to Honduras, I barely speak Spanish. And I, it was, I had a strong accent, uh, Cuban accent. And everybody like, are you even Honduran? I'm like, yes. And, um, but, you know, job opportunities in Honduras is, is so small. Right now, only the people that know two languages, like, like myself, they are the ones that they have some sort of opportunity to get a job as an interpreter or call, uh, call centers, stuff like that. And they also, uh, it's a shame that in Honduras, they always, when, when they throw out there in the news that they're looking for someone for a certain position, they always say between 18 and 30. So if you're over 30, there's no job for you. Even if you call and ask them, I got all the um, skills that you're asking for, but I'm over 30, I'm sorry. In your affidavit for the immigration court, we addressed the violence and how the violence in, in Honduras affected you and your family. Could you just talk really briefly about the violence in your neighborhood, some of the things that you heard about and saw, just for a minute to give people an idea of the nightmare that you were describing? Well, um, just, just to remember a few, they found a pregnant woman cut in pieces in a dumpster right in front of the neighborhood. They also found another body on the, because I live close to the ocean. They found another body uh, naked with her chest ripped off. They found bodies in, in uh, those big uh, garbage bags, the black ones in there. It's, it's crazy, there's a lot of gangs out there and Whoever owns a business out there, you have to pay a, a war fee, something like that. And if you don't pay it, they're not going to act you twice. They will kill you. So everybody who wants to open a business, they have to think about it real well because they have, they have to not only pay their utilities and everything, they have to pay them, the gang, for them to be able to work and, and earn their living. If there's, is, uh, what, we have time for one more question in the middle. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I'm just wondering, now that you have your, um, your green card, are you um, going to apply for a citizenship or are you thinking of doing that? And what would it mean to you to um, be a U.S. citizen after the U.S. government has sort of put you through a pretty long ordeal? Have you applied for U.S. citizenship? Um, would you, or do you wish to apply for U.S. citizenship? And how would you feel about becoming a U.S. citizen, since you have been fighting the U.S. government all these years and they've made your life so difficult? That's a beautiful question. Actually, that's the first question I asked my lawyers when I was granted uh, cancellation removal. I say, when do when do I take that exam? I'm ready. And they say, unfortunately, you have to wait five years. So I'm hoping. 
you know, the law change or whatever, but I'm ready. I can do it right now. I'm ready. Um, we're going to now turn to the, the first two of our panelists, but I have one last thing I just wanted to bring out from Wilmer. Um, when we, Brianna and Danielle McLaughlin, who some of the attorneys worked on this case at the very end of the case, we went to visit Wilmer um, after he'd been brought, he came back to the United States and was reunited with his family. Some met, um, his parents and sisters are here today. Um, some of his extended family wanted to visit him, and he was staying in a private um, detention center run by the Geo Group, one of the large um, private uh, correctional companies that runs detention centers and other prisons in this country. And so um, I thought that maybe you could tell the story of how many people came to visit you that day, what did the guards tell them when they said they wanted to visit you, and how did you get, and then what happened? So first, the first question is, how many people came to visit you that day? Okay, um, pretty much my whole family, my brother, my sister, even my sister from Miami came down, my parents, my sister-in-law, they only had um, like certain limit of how many people can go in and visit you at, at the same time. Yeah, so, they, so how many people do you think came in the car that day? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight. Okay, eight people. And so they, eight people, most of whom haven't seen him for how many years? Many years. Yeah, some, some people had never, like your nephew had never met you. Right. And, um, and then they were confronted with the private immigration guards who said, sorry, only two people can come in. Exactly, only two people. And I told him, I told her, um, listen, you have to understand that I haven't seen my family for so long. This, this is the first time I'm gonna be seeing my nephew and his wife since 14, 15 years. And please do me a favor. I know, I know that in your heart, I can see it on you that you have a great heart and you are able to do it if you want to. Okay. So what I want, so, so what, what we, we heard this story and in the end, the immigration, the guard that um, allowed his family to come in shifts through. And just, just an hour or two later or, or before, Brianna and I had gone to that very same facility and had this, just a ridiculous conversation. It was like Kafkaesque. Can we bring, I can't remember what it was, can we bring in a suit for him for court? No, you can't. You have to call this office. We call that office. You have to call the other office. No, no. We've never seen that. It's not in the book. So we were using our lawyer skills and getting nowhere. And, and I, I just thought that story brought out how Wilmer, with his faith, and his, um, you know, he connected people with the goodness, and he brought out goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. So thank you very much, everyone. My name is Jessica Kiko. I was an attorney at the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project from 2010 until 2015, and then briefly again in 2016, 2017. So I've seen this case over the course of many years. And I just wanted to start off by saying thank you first to Wilmer um, and to his family for always having hope and faith that this night would come. It's an honor to finally be in the same room as Wilmer. I just met him in person um, about an hour ago. And, and it's one of those moments in my life that I'll never forget. Uh, thank you to the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, to Dan and to Brinton for making the work possible for dreaming it up before it was ever a thing. Um, to Rolo, the rest of the team at Nixon for taking the impossible and seeing it through. And I thought I would start off just by talking a little bit about how I came to PDHRP and to work on Wilmer's case. I came to PDHRP in the summer of 2010, um, knowing that the focus was on innovative, legal, cutting edge issues, on difficult cases, on working with clients who would have really complex immigration histories, complex um, procedural histories, complex personal histories. And I had a pretty unique background, I think, at that point of actually having done a post-deportation case as a law student um, way back in 2006, uh, doing what turned out to be kind of the equivalent of the tail end of Wilmer's case, uh, the bringing back part and, and winning relief, not all the legwork I got to do on this one. So I think 
in my heart, I always knew that this work was possible and that it needed to be done. And I was only at PDHRP for about six weeks, um, still kind of trying to figure out if I could park in the yellow or white spaces <laughs> at Boston College and how to work the voicemail system. When I get a call from Trina Romuto, who then was at the National Immigration Project, saying, hey, listen, I got this call from this guy. He's in Honduras. Um, he was deported on aggravated felony grounds. It's crazy. It was just a simple possession. He came across the Lopez case. Can you do a motion to reopen? And I was like, sure. Um, this is what we're here for. And it was the very first case that I accepted at PDHRP. Um, and it stayed with me throughout my time at the project and clearly beyond. Um, and my relationship with Wilmer during that time grew. We saw each other through pregnancies and babies. Um, and Wilmer would often say, you know, I trust, as Heather was saying, I trust, I believe, I know that this will be so. And um, I found myself in the kind of soul-crushing lawyer position of being like, well, you know, it depends. <laughs> Unfortunately, the odds are stacked against us. Um, but as actually many of my clients have um, in doing my immigration work, he saw the finish line um, long before I could. Um, and the facts of the case were simple. They were straightforward. They were compelling. You heard them from Wilmer. I don't need to recite them again. Um, and the arbitrary nature of what had happened, um, the fact that what had happened to him would not have happened to someone two years later, um, was really striking. And it was the type of thing that really got to you and really fired you up, or it got to me um, and fired me up. Um, and I mean, you know, here's a situation where someone was subject to mandatory detention. We didn't even really talk about that. Mandatory detention, mandatory deportation, based on a reading of the law that at this point, when I came across the case, everybody agreed was wrong. Um, here's someone who was a green card uh, holder in the United States since childhood. His entire family was here. He finished high school. He had one run-in with the law. That had been pardoned. But here's someone that was facing you know, immigration detention during Hurricane Katrina, who had been told by his lawyer there was nothing that could be done, um, who had very few resources, uh, no access to counsel. As he said, his family sought advice, got bad advice. Essentially kind of the poster child for the right to challenge your case post-departure. And I'll put a plug in here that I think you know, the issues and the rights um, that we stood up for in Wilmer's case, I equally believe for people that perhaps don't look like the poster child. Um, but Wilmer had it all. Um, and the legal argument was perhaps a little less straightforward than the facts, um, but the rights underlying it all, the right to have the opportunity to challenge a wrong decision, a decision that everybody agreed was wrong, the right to be heard, the right not to be dismissed and not to be ignored just because they had physically removed you and pretended you were no longer a problem. Um, that all seemed really straightforward, and, and that's the kind of explanation that I gave to people who perhaps weren't as geeky as me and as Rolla became <laughs> about the ins and outs of the federal regulation and the departure bar. And the legal question um, at the center of it all was the validity of this federal regulation, which, by the way, is still on the books. Um, that states that motion to reopen shall not be brought or uh, by or on behalf of an individual who has been subject to deportation proceedings and has departed the United States, which in most cases mean, means has been departed, has been deported. Um, and the Board of Immigration Appeals that kind of oversees all the immigration judges, as I look around, most of you are immigration lawyers, so I probably don't need that explanation. Um, but the board had read this to be a jurisdictional bar. They basically said, you're no longer here. We can't even you know, consider uh, your question. We don't even have authority to look at your case again. And that had been upheld um, by some circuits. Um, interestingly, the board took a different position when they wanted to. For example, they said, if you're in deportation proceedings and you leave, well, even though you're not here, we can still order you deported. Right? So it, it was a nuanced um, interpretation on their part. And the Fifth Circuit, uh, which oversees the immigration courts in Louisiana, had upheld that interpretation. And in Wilmer's story, we really had an opportunity to challenge um, that interpretation. So 
as Wilmer um, already discussed, we filed a motion to reopen in December 2010, right around Christmas time. Uh, Wilmer and I first spoke, um, I think, the first week of October 2010. During that time, not only had we, um, not only did we have to actually write the motion to reopen, but we actually had to put together a cancellation of removal package, essentially a packet of the equities to convince a judge that not only was the case reopenable, but it should be reopened, and furthermore, once reopened, he would win on his ultimate uh, claim of being able to remain in the United States. So we filed it knowing that it would be denied, and it was denied, you're right, <coughs> like in two or three weeks. Um, and then we appealed it knowing that that would be denied at the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and then we appealed again to the Fifth Circuit. And we prepared Wilmer for a long fight. Turns out we were right. It was a very long fight. And as the case was moving towards the Fifth Circuit, um, the issue was being put forth in other circuits as well. Um, and at least some of the courts were beginning to recognize that at least in some circumstances, individuals had a right um, to have a motions to reopen, at least be considered and be adjudicated uh, in some circumstances. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the Ninth Circuit has some good decisions on the topic. The Seventh Circuit came out with a good one right before we filed. The Sixth Circuit had a good decision while we were winding our way up to the Fifth. Yeah, does it bring back memories? Um, <laughs> Other decisions were less helpful. The Second Circuit, which is usually um, pretty a, a thoughtful circuit on immigration issues, had kind of split decisions, one saying, yes, we can, the other one saying, no, you can't. I'll spare you the details. Um, and part of my work at PDHRP was to kind of keep on top of all these cases, see what was working, what wasn't working, um, talk to not only deported individuals, but the attorneys that were attempting these cases, which uh, at the time was very few and far between and with lots of hurdles. Um, so we drafted practice advisories to kind of um, let attorneys know that this was possible. We were doing it, you know, we, we think we can prevail, we think you can too. Lots of phone calls and emails, reading all the briefs and listening to all the oral arguments from all, all the other cases that had presented similar issues. Um, and at the same time, to the point that somebody raised in a question, um, also kind of learning more about the network of deported individuals around the world uh, in different countries, how deported people find each other and find support uh, with one another and the resources that are available uh, from the U.S. but also in country um, that have been created for deported individuals. Um, and, you know, we made decisions about how to argue the case um, over many conversations, the details of which I cannot recall, um, knowing that some arguments would be stronger than others, knowing, um, thanks to Dan, that we always had to push for that substantive due process argument. Um, and over the course of my time, I spoke or emailed or Facebook messaged with probably close to a thousand deportees. Um, the vast majority of them, green card, um, green card holders that had been deported for many, many times, nonviolent criminal convictions. Um, and so, in, in a way, in the situation that Wilmer was in, having the Supreme Court recognize that the basis um, for which you were deported was a misinterpretation of the law was not unique. Um, the Supreme Court, you know, before the Lopez decision and after the Lopez decision, uh, and the circuit courts as well, have repeatedly said, you know, like, whoops, uh, you know, we got it wrong, or the other court, the lower courts had it wrong, this is the correct interpretation of the law. Um, and this has happened repeatedly, especially with criminal grounds of deportation. But for thousands of deported individuals, that recognition really meant nothing. Um, and in Wilmer's case, I think we really saw an opportunity to give not only Wilmer, but also other similarly situated individuals another chance. One of the things that I told Wilmer when I first met him right over there was, you know, your case has been cited um, repeatedly and it has helped people and other people have been successful in getting their cases reopened and reheard um, because of the fight that you undertook. Um, and that was really meaningful. Um, it's a chance, of course, that doesn't come without challenges because even when the law creates an opportunity um, to revisit your case, even when the law allows you a vehicle 
to request that opportunity, there are still many practical obstacles, um, like the ones that Wilmer shared, like you know, finding out um, that these things have changed, finding somebody that can help you make the filing that will um, see you through, that will make the many phone calls um, that are necessary to get you back in country if your case is reopened. And so the practical obstacles of actually doing so continue to abound, I think. Um, and about two years after filing the motion to reopen, we received an invitation, an invitation to oral argument at the Fifth Circuit. Um, we had the benefit of having a companion case, so another case that raised similar issues, and that really allowed us to coordinate a little bit with counsel on that case, um, to tag team um, a little bit, and to raise more, I think, than otherwise we may have been able to do, and to be more responsive um, to the concerns of the judges. And I think I'll let you talk a little bit more about the Fifth Circuit, and then we'll hear from others about what happened um, after that. So I'll end it there. Great, thanks. Uh, well, first, thank you. <laughs> thanks, everyone. I'm Ronaldo Rosario Recupero. I'm a litigator at Nixon Peabody. Um, and I am very glad to sit next to Wilmer. This makes me very, very happy. Uh, I, I've been, I've been, been, you know, you get involved in a case, and I talk about Wilmer every day for you know six or seven years. Eventually, uh, I'm glad to actually have finally made it to the finish line here, um, and I'm honored to be here with Jess as well. Um, it's it is a bit surreal, uh, and I'm privileged to be able to come back to the room where I was taught uh, constitutional law uh, and where I hid in evidence law, and, um, but where I sat in the front row for human rights law. Um, and there is a, uh, it, it's a great place uh, because this is a place that believes that the students it uh, is educating uh, will have a chance to use the, the skills that uh, we learn from those who are generous enough with their time, with talent, and treasure to give us a chance to go out and try uh, to do with them what we have, have been asked, which is do good for others. Um, and I have been, I am here and I'm, I, I'm doing this because I am privileged to be able to be on a team where we were able um, to do that. And it is not every day uh, as a litigator, my normal, uh, my normal day job is defending those who are uh, facing government investigations sometimes of a different kind, uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, uh, lots of different clients, all of whom need a good defense, and I defend them from investigations, which are all of which need, need strong defenses in their own ways. But it's not every day that you get a chance to hear uh, a story like Wilmer's and to see an injustice like Wilmer's and get an invitation to help. And so at that point, uh, you, there are three main reasons, and I'll be the litigator and give you three reasons for everything. There are three reasons why we agreed to take on this case. Um, the first reason uh, are the equities. What Wilmer explained was just an unfairness that was so plain on the nose of its face. The idea that simply because the United States can deport someone fast enough that they are outside the United States more than 90 days means that any defect, how egregious the defect is, has no bearing on whether they will have the opportunity to even be heard by an immigration judge is one, especially given the facts of Wilmer's case, and especially it was appealing to me because I also was a naturalized American. I didn't realize I was also born in 1982. I was born in Colombia in 1982. And seeing Wilmer's case and knowing that you can be a naturalized American, someone who has the label legal permanent resident, and yet for a simple possession infraction be banished in a way that return would be so improbable <clears throat> struck me as so unfair that we needed to devo devote resources in order to correct that wrong. Um, and simply doing my best to marshal the resources of my firm to help a case uh, of such injustice and that would make such a difference in, in, a, in the life of someone who, whom I could identify uh, was very meaningful to me. Uh, the second reason, which I'll say is tied for first, is the deep learning that came from the folks at PDHRP. I had a chance to talk with Jess extensively because one of my first concerns was we need to do no harm. 
this is a this is a very sensitive area of the law where precedential cases before circuits and especially the fifth circuit the fifth circuit which is one of the most conservative cases in circuits in the united states if if this did not go well it would not only be devastating for Wilmer, but could have devastating consequences for others who are similarly situated. So as always, when you're designing a public interest strategy, um, you want to make sure that the cases that are selected um, give you the chance to both do right by your client and do right by the law. And, and one of the beautiful things about being able to work with PDHRP on was they understood in a deep sense um, and, and I would say different than other public interest organizations who are also in this field because by pairing with Boston College and, and the Center for Human Rights and International Justice, they brought to bear both the analytical understanding of the legal framework and a deep knowledge of what administrative law and constitutional law, how they met in the immigration law system that came from years of deep and rigorous and scholarly study. And they studied the impact that deportation had on both those who had been deported and the communities to which they had been deported. And that brought the deep learning and confidence for me to be able to go to my firm and say, we are going to be devoting resources to this case because the equities work, because it has an opportunity to do well, and because we are sure that this is the type of case that can advance the ball as part of the overlying puzzle of fighting and chipping away and doing that work circuit by circuit, case by case, to, to defeat the, the post uh, the post departure bar, um, and then of course there's the third factor of the three factors, which is I am a Boston College Law School alumnus. <laughs> Daniel Canstrom calls me. That's it. <laughs> that's all you do, and that's what we technically call in the law the determining determining dispositive factor as to why we had to take the case. Um, but uh, I had the I had the pleasure of joining the case after that careful work had been done to determine what we needed to do and how we could, how the Fifth Circuit fit into it. Now the Fifth Circuit, you may remember, is also the case, the circuit that brought us um, the case that, uh, that defeated DACA. Uh, so it was not a place where uh, we, were, we were striding with great uh, confidence that it would uh, necessarily come out uh, with, a, with a, an outcome that would result in a panel like today. It's basically the opposite of the Ninth Circuit. But luckily what happened, and I, I do credit this to uh, Providence and, and Blessing, was that we got a panel that would listen. Uh, Judge Stewart, Judge DeMoss, and Judge Jolly uh, was a panel that was not full of uh, some other judges who we thought would be particularly hostile to our position, which gave us a great leg up. And working with others uh, from the National Lawyers Guild and the National Immigration Project, we were able to have that double argument that Jess mentioned. Um, but Jess went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Fifth Circuit on the departure bar. And um, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely, it was remarkable. I got, you know, I said, well, Jess, you, you know, you can go first. I think it would be wonderful if you just, you know, I got a chance to... Uh, can I tell a funny story about that? Uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, that this was my first oral argument in circuit court, and my, and my last. Um, <laughs> and I knew that there was a lighting system, that when it was green you could speak, and when it was red you had to shut up unless the judges said, please, counsel, keep speaking. What I did not know is that the light would only turn green once you started to speak. Oh. And so I stood there for quite some while, <laughs> staring down the judges, waiting for that light to turn, and finally they were like, uh, you, you may proceed. Um, so if you listen to that oral argument as I did in preparation for this. You can hear my voice just shaking just a tad <laughs> the first 10 seconds trying to recuperate from that moment. But, well, I mean, but she... But after that. I mean. no, and after that, I mean, the judges pressed her significantly on the question. I mean, there were some serious questions about what the implications of, of this would be. I mean, at some point, the, the court was saying, when is enough enough? When is a case going to be over? Is there not an interest in finality? Is there not a point at which it is over? and just batted it back masterfully. She was able to explain that what we are asking for is the opportunity for adjudication, that having a right to reopen, that statutory right to reopen, is absolutely hollow if the Board of Immigration Appeals simply throws out the application. And I will credit, uh, there was a great team at Nixon PD who did it, um, Maya Harris, our office managing partner, our, our pro bono committee, but I will credit uh, the supervising partner, Maya Harris, who said, Find a physical metaphor 
And so we talked about the envelope. We said, there, if what, what has been done below is the Board of Immigration Appeals simply looks at the postmark. They say outside the United States and they don't even bother to open the envelope. That is not what a motion to reopen is intended to be. And I think through Jess's good work, she was able to lay that, framework, lay that foundation. My job was to argue that, that Wilmer had been diligent. As you can tell, pr arguing that Wilmer is diligent is not a very difficult task. You simply lay out what he did, and that made my job and my life very easy. Um, and it, 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 it gave, the, but what it did do is give the court a chance to understand the equities, that this is not somebody simply trying to quote unquote prolong a case or refight another, an old battle that had already been fought. We were able to distinguish the fact that there were separate legal remedies that were available uh, in order to make sure that he could, he could be heard. It, well, it was a two to one decision, um, but for one vote, things could have been different. Um, but we will take that victory and uh, I will take it, and Fifth Circuit is particularly meaningful uh, for two quick reasons. One is um, one out of four deportations out of the United States occur out of the Fifth Circuit. So winning there opened it up. Uh, it was a big circuit just numerically to get that win. Um, but m some of you may remember that uh, in the Michael Bianco raids, for example, that happened here in Massachusetts, I had one of those cases, they were actually putting people on planes and instead of deporting them out of the First Circuit or out of Massachusetts, where they knew they could fight their cases, they were putting people on planes and deporting them out of Texas because they knew they would be less likely to fight their cases in Texas. And now, thanks to Wilmers having the courage to stick with the case all the way to the end to make that victory happen, those folks have the right to file their motions to reopen and have their opportunity to be heard. Uh, his case has been cited 33 times so far, and we don't know how many other cases have been able to bring their motions to reopen, but I know it will, it will have a chance. And the other piece to remember is that what, what Wilmer was arguing was that the aggravated felony determination was not, uh, was the defect in his, in his removal proceedings. That the, that the crime for which he had uh, uh, been pardoned was not truly an aggravated felony. The Supreme Court has since taken that same principle and applied it in other, in other ways. For example, crime of violence. There has recently been a case, Sessions v. DeMaia, where they have explained that certain, case, certain crimes that were originally thought to be crimes of violence were in fact not crimes of violence. So now, thanks, if you're out in the Fifth Circuit, thanks to Wilmer, you can file a motion to reopen uh, and have it be considered by the immigration judge if you were wrongly deported because the immigration judge thought that your crime was a crime of violence when it in fact was not. I have one of those cases and we will be arguing that and we will continue to argue this. Um, and we went back and forth and I learned a lot of lessons here and, there, and I know time is short but there's one I want, I, I want to mention and it's about how you argue what you argue. Uh, we did briefs back and forth and Jess would always correct all of the uh, pieces that we would send over from uh, our Nixon team, for which I take full credit. You'll, you'll meet Brianna here, who was wonderful and uh, made those briefs uh, shine. But one thing that we always had with respect to edits, um, there was always one last argument that was left. I would always get it, we, we'd go back and forth and, and, and we talked to Wilmer about how we're gonna present it, and um, Professor Canstrom would always have this one line, don't forget due process. Don't forget due process because non-citizens have due process rights. Remind the court of that. We argued this. The government ignored it. The courts did not listen to it. I'm not sure they got to it in an oral argument. But what we did include in our brief every time was the words from Francis versus INS from 1976. Fundamental fairness dictates that permanent resident aliens who are in like circumstances but for irrelevant and fortuitous factors deserve to be treated in a like manner. That is what we argued because that is what PDHRP stood for and what, when we had the chance to bring all of the learning and the depth and the breadth by putting their name on this brief, that's what they wanted to argue. And I was proud to be able to be the conduit for them to bring that argument back. Now, they didn't use it in this case, but I'll share with you, I was in federal court the other day and uh, we had, there was another immigration case they were trying to deport 80 individuals and argument after argument was being shot down, shot down and at some point the court looked at me and said 
there's this note in your brief about fundamental fairness and non-citizens. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I smiled because I re learned the lesson to remember to advocate what you're trying to get across to the court because fundamental fairness matters. That's what I learned here. That's what I learned through this case. And that's what I'm grateful that uh, Wilmer was able to show through his courage. So I'm very glad to be with you. Again this morning. Mary's first. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I walked in late, Wilmer. Congratulations to you and all of the work that you have done and all the faith that you have put into this process, into this law school. Um, so anyway, and I apologize for being late. I run our immigration clinic, and I was actually at court in Boston coming from there. So trying to uphold the due process rights of a detainee. So um, here's my question. And, and also, Rolo, I just want to comment that um, that physical metaphor worked for you because our immigration agencies still don't use electronic filings. So there actually is a physical envelope. So it actually works. It wouldn't have worked. The federal courts, that may have been lost on the federal courts because it's all electronic. Um, but, you know, I think about this a lot because I litigate in um, habeas uh, for and, and trying to advance some issues um, in and on behalf of an individual, but to impact the broader range of cases. And we always think about, do we use our client's name? Do we file as John Doe? Um, you know, sort of like, what does it mean to you to be the name of this thing, to be the poster child? And would you have preferred, if given the option, because you don't always have this option, to, to be John Doe, to be the anonymous um, facts that were laid out that were sad? Um, but I would love to hear that coming from you, Wilmer. about you and now it's known and your name is on this case. How do you feel about that, having it be public about your case? Well, um, it is a great honor. It is a great honor to see my name there and to show the world that nothing is impossible. And when you have the right people behind you, like Nixon Peabody and like Post the Protection Human Rights Project with God's blessing, it's just to show the world that nothing is impossible. And on habeas, I would just note on habeas that um, in our efforts to get Wilmer back, which you will hear about from Brianna, she's going to tell you about how it took to get, get us back, we were threatening the government with habeas suits if they didn't come back. So the work that you're doing, uh, potentially running into federal court to make sure that the rights of those who uh, either are trying to be returned or are in detention now and can be uh, um, released from detention are critical to getting these types of outcomes. wonderful culmination and perfection of Wilmer's journey after their decision? The, the judges? Yes. Uh, they, they haven't had reason uh, to know it, although... Uh, we could send them a copy of the autobiography. Yeah. I, I, it, might, it might make a difference in how they feel. Yeah. Well, it's, it, I, I, uh, I was at a wedding and bumped into someone who was in Judge Stewart's chambers. And he said, I know you from somewhere. Are you a lawyer? I said, oh boy, I wasn't me. Um, but he, he obviously, he remembered the case. And he said, the judges remember this case. Yeah. Um, and uh, we will do our best to get messages back that, yeah. uh, uh, that outcomes, the faith, faith was not displaced when, when uh, they went and took the time to carefully reason these pair of decisions together. Like I said, it was in tandem. So they were under, they, they, they took the time
time to real this pan this actual it's the same panel for both cases. They really took the time to dig into that. Mm. Um, so uh, we'll try to get informal message. But I like the idea of sending yeah. sending a copy of the book to the Fine judges. Copy. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the. Um, you said you had to make arguments about his diligence in pursuing the case. <clears throat> And again, Wilmer, thanks for being here. Um, but I, that was the part that I was a little confused about, that four years after this decision on what constitutes an aggravated felony. And I could see that you've been deported, and you don't have access to all the resources you would here. And I'm, I imagine there was an ineffective assistance claim or something along those lines, that he was given bad advice at some point before he was deported. Um, and you seem to be sort of like, oh, that was the easy part of the argument. But that, to me, seems like it was maybe a little more difficult than you're letting on. Well, um, I, I will be as I'll let you. The, I, like a good circuit court judge, you caught the elision, and I'm pointing on it because she won, and I essentially lost, which is basically what happened. She, we won. Well, we won on the on the question of post deportation, uh, on the post deportation bar right. itself. So the bar, we got a very nice ruling. The Fifth Circuit carefully with, with Zer, reserved its, its determination as to whether Wilmer had, at that stage, demonstrated he had satisfied the requirements for what's called equitable tolling. So in, in brief, uh, equitable tolling is read into every federal statute so that at, We at, argue. We, we are. I, I assert. I assert. Right. I, I assert it's read into every federal statute since 1946. And for untimely motions, and, and, and the BIA case law bears this out, and, and the circuit court case law bears this out, um, that uh, if you demonstrate diligence, um, you should be able to have your, your case uh, considered. Now, there were there were nuances to this. So the board, the, the Fifth Circuit reserved and did not decide whether Wilmer had met the equitable tolling standard. It remanded to the Board of Immigration Appeals to make that decision, who then remanded to the Board of to Immigration Court, where we lost. Uh, and then we had to appeal that again and again. But I will, and let me at this point make an important point here. Um, we went back down to Louisiana because the case was, was in Louisiana. And at every single court hearing, um, there was one family in that courtroom, and that was Wilmer's family. And every time judge, the same judge saw that family, and they saw that family sitting there and knowing, and literally by the physical manifestation of their diligence being there, I think he understood in a more visceral way, this is a man who was diligent. And I think that that made a real difference. We, were, we, were, we argued the equities of his diligence, and eventually we won. We eventually got him to, to determine equitable tolling. But it is true. We had to be very careful because there are other individuals situated who might not have had their motion to reopen filed within the 90 days. Um, and so we were arguing that each case has to be dealt with on its individual basis, and you can't use a bright line 90-day rule. There are other parts of this. There are reasons they were looking at to that 90-day, because that's a, that's a deadline in other portions of the statute, but we uh, of some applicable statutes that are related but not controlling here. And so our argument was you have to have a chance to look at it. But it is true. If you discover that your deportation is unlawful 10 years, 20 years out, our argument is you should have the chance to at least have that heard with respect to equity. I've got another case that's going on right now with a similar thing filed within 30 days, and they said that was not equitable enough. We're going to have time for more questions for a full panel um, after the, the, the next three panelists go. But um, our next up is Rana Nassim. Thank you. Um, I am uh, Brianna Nassif. I work at Nixon TBD with Ronaldo and others, and um, it's great to be back here. I actually graduated from here in 2017, so I remember being in those seats a lot more than being up here. Um, thank you to Wilmer for being here and for sharing your story and allowing me to play a small part of it. Um, and it's so great to see Wilmer's family here. Um, we met in Louisiana for the hearing, and it's great being in in the same space celebrating the success with you. Um, I would say that Ronaldo just mentioned the family showing up in court and we had quite the support group at the individual hearing back in May. Um, and I think the security guard made some comment that they had never seen so many people in a courtroom for one of these proceedings and it definitely makes a difference to have that show of support. 
um, especially from family members, um, in what was actually quite a remote court. So it was, it was great to have all of you there, and it's great to see you here today. Um, as I mentioned, I graduated from here, from BC Law, in May 2017. Um, I started my legal career at Nixon Peabody that October, and in December of that year, Ronaldo asked me to join um, this case team. And as he alluded to, I joined this case at a very important moment, because after years of back and forth, which you can see on your handy chart, um, Blower had a master calendar hearing scheduled for January 30th, 2018, so just about a year ago. Um, however, this is where any semblance of a typical proceeding or normal proceeding kind of ended. Um, you know, in law school, you hear a lot about getting your day in court. Um, Wilmer was finally granted his day in court, which was a great success, but physically getting him to the court was a whole different ballgame. Um, I'm not going to get into the weeds on every little thing we did and every effort we made, but I put together that timeline on the back of your handout just really just for the visual of the amount of effort it took between November of 2017 and at the end, to the end of March 2018 to get Wilmer here for his hearing. Um, you know, despite all of these efforts, we were incredibly fortunate to have succeeded the, in coordinating this return. Um, it took until literally the very last moment, the day Wilmer's flight was booked, for him to actually get the requisite paperwork from the embassy in Honduras to be able to come back to the United States. Um, and as much stress and anxiety as it caused us, um, we felt very fortunate to actually have someone on the ground in Honduras who was kind of willing to go out of his way to facilitate this return. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details on the state of the law and immigration policies on returning um, LPRs, um, but just wanted to provide some context about kind of the lay of the land and what we were up against. Um, back in 2008, the government represented to the Supreme Court um, that it had a policy of facilitating the return of non-citizens who prevail in their immigration cases from abroad. Immigration advocates after this case, unaware of such a policy, um, filed multiple FOIA requests for more information. Uh, these FOIA requests, as well as subsequent litigation, revealed that there was no such policy and that the government had made a misrepresentation to the Supreme Court. Um, as a result, ICE quickly scrambled together a directive in 2012 that was titled Facilitating the Return to the United States of Certain Lawfully Removed Aliens. It also issued FAQs to provide guidance and clarity with regard to the implementation of this directive. Um, the government then at this point acknowledged its misrepresentation to the Supreme Court and pointed to these policies to argue that their decision should not be invalidated or reconsidered. The ICE directive was flawed from the start. The position created by the directive to coordinate this facilitated return was defunded by Congress one year later in 2013. The directive also explicitly states that it is non-binding and lacks the force of law. And on our research, we came across many instances <coughs> in which ICE failed to comply with its own policy. Um, and we knew, we knew at that point we were in for a bumpy ride. Um, once it became clear that the government was not going to comply with its own directive, we knew that we needed to exhaust all options and to build a record in case we needed to litigate this in the future. Um, one of our greatest concerns throughout this process was that we did not subject Wilmer to in absentia removal. Um, you know, we were facing many, many unknowns, but the one thing we knew for certain was that that was not how Wilmer's story was going to end, and we would do everything we could to prevent that. Um, we made every effort to negotiate with the government, some of which is in your timeline, uh, I'm sure I missed some, um, to get Wilmer back to the United States. Um, when this didn't seem possible, we filed many, many motions, either to waive his presence or to continue the master calendar hearing to a later date. Um, those efforts were kind of met with mixed success, um, and we knew that even if we got over this hurdle at the <coughs> master calendar, we would still need to figure out how to get Wilmer here for his individual hearing where he could present his case. So knowing that the circumstances were unique and the procedural posture was not your typical case, we complied with the directive as closely as we could. Um, and we had multiple follow-ups with, with the government, the ICE, DHS, Ronaldo took the brunt of most of those, lots of calls on hold, disconnected calls, the record was 43 minutes and then a disconnection one day. <laughs> um, it was a frustrating uh, process, but we knew we needed to do it and that we needed to document it. Um, 
you know, and as these efforts stalled, we began to think outside of the box. We really, you know, we were hopped on calls all the time. We did everything we could think of. We tried to coordinate with the U.S. Embassy in Honduras to allow for telephonic testimony. We, when that failed, we tried the same thing with the Embassy in El Salvador. Maybe they would allow us to, ha to do this. And eventually we actually filed a motion to compel DHS to return Wilmer to the United States, and that was not effective. Um, and we started drafting um, mandamus complaint and preparing a record for litigation. Um, at the same time, another concern was Wilmer's detention status upon his return, and we've touched on this, and um, so I won't go into too much detail, but as you've heard, the Fifth Circuit is not a pleasant one to be in and is not friendly to these sorts of cases, so we knew that he would not be eligible for bond when he returned. Um, this meant that he would have to be detained during the pendency of his case, including any possible appeal. Um, we moved to transfer venue to Boston. Uh, we're pro bono attorneys. He wants, we need to be close to our client. Um, well, that was unsuccessful, but we had to try. Um, <laughs> and that was denied. Um, the government eventually told us that they would return Wilmer to the United States, but that he would be deported. Um, they denied, detained. sorry, detained, sorry. Detained when he returned to the United States. Um, we asked for reconsideration. They denied that. Um, you know, knowing about the horrible experience that Wilmer had in detention back in 2005, it was really quite unfathomable to have to ask him to go back <coughs> into detention when he returned. Um, but Wilmer is courageous and strong and unfailingly positive, and he agreed to come back, even if it meant being detained for weeks or months. Um, so Wilmer ultimately flew back to the United States in March 26, 2018, and he was taken into detention. We didn't know where his hearings would be. He flew into Houston, but we were told that it could be in Houston or in Oakdale, Louisiana, or Gina, Louisiana. Um, we don't need to get on those details, but as you heard, we ended up back in Oakdale, Louisiana before Judge Duck, where an earlier proceeding in the case had occurred. Um, while Wilmer was in Honduras, we, specifically Heather and I and um, our colleague Danielle, worked tirelessly to prepare the strongest possible case um, to present to the court. Uh, we used to call it the red carpet treatment, <laughs> trying to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, you know, many of the laws didn't address Wilmer's specific circumstance, and there wasn't much guidance on how to adjust the current laws to a circumstance like Wilmer's. For example, in establishing potential future harm. Well, we had 12 years of harm that Wilmer had actually suffered. Could we rely on that in our pleading? Or would the court want to hear more about what the harm would be if he was deported in May 2018? We really tried to cover all of our bases, um, but these were the kinds of issues that we grappled with in preparing our briefing and accompanying materials for his hearing. Um, and ultimately, we prevailed, and I could spend much more time discussing the details of our strategy and the complications, but um, I know time is short, and I just want to reflect briefly on this experience. Um, you know, law school teaches you many things, and I was fresh out of law school, so I remembered it dearly. Um, but it does not teach you what to do when you are facing a complete unknown and fighting a battle with little to no legal precedent. We didn't know how this would end. We didn't know how the law would be applied to Wilmer. We didn't know if he'd be able to come back for his hearing. We didn't always know where to turn to, but this is where partnering with BC and with the project really helped us, and it was invaluable. You know, everyone involved in this case brought years of immigration law experience and expertise, um, and we were able to partner with so many leaders in the field across the country to kind of make this success possible. And, you know, with the project behind us, I know at least I felt confident that no stone was left unturned and that we were pursuing every potential option to, to succeed and to, for my purposes here right now, to bring Wilmer back to the United States. Um, and as a junior lawyer, kind of starting my career, I was especially grateful to learn from such effective and knowledgeable advocates um, and immigration attorneys. Uh, you know, no one gave up on this case. We always redoubled our efforts. We expanded our outreach. We advocated harder, and I think you've heard some of that today. And, um, you know, I'm proud and humbled to have played a small, small part in the success, and specifically the last column of your windy timeline. <laughs> um, so I'm running out of time, but what I do want to mention is that Wilmer has always kind of been the MVP of our team, um, and we couldn't have done this Without him, he, um, you know, always believed in our, in us, in our abilities to succeed, um, and he understood the risks and the complications in his case, and really willingly rode this roller coaster with us. Um, and in the face of so much, 
kind of unfairness and uncertainty, he always brought stability, patience, positivity, and, and faith. Um, you know, Wilmer touches everyone he meets, and I'm sure you've all kind of gotten a glimpse of that today. Um, but he's the kind of client that pushes you to be the best <coughs> advocate you can be and to do, um, to leave everything on the table. So this would not have been possible without Wilmer. Um, you know, this is not the first time that I've met Wilmer. I was lucky enough to meet him in Louisiana, but this is the first time I've met you as a free man, and it's great to see you and your beautiful family here, and I look forward to the day that Anna Maria and the Free Boys can join you in Louisiana. We just got um, a few more comments before we open it up for questions um, from myself and the co-director of the center, Brinton. Actually, can we be over here, Brinton? Um, and, and then we'll have a question and answer that Dan's going to moderate. Um, the theme that we're addressing is mutual accompaniment. And I'm actually going to be extremely brief in my remarks because most of what I want to say has already been said. Um, I want to just focus on the fact that this project and this effort is part of a larger mission of not just the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, but the Center for Human Rights and International Justice. And Brinton, who's the co-director, will say more about that. But for me, um, the mutuality uh, piece and the accompaniment piece is something that I've learned about. The accompaniment piece is a term that I've learned about here at Boston College Law School and understand that it comes in part from liberation theology. Um, but this process, as you've of youth, as you've heard about, has been deeply collaborative, both between the attorneys, but also, um, as Brianna just made mention of, with our client. Um, he, was a, he was a member of the team. And when I, took, when I joined the case at the very tail end, the very tip of the tail, um, at, where we were preparing the sort of final piece of the cancellation application that Jessica, at the beginning of the tale, prepared back in 2010 and then um, augmented in 2014 when the case went back down to immigration court. We were there to sort of polish this case. And this, what is this case at this point? The technical legal material had been taken care of by Jessica and Ronaldo. And there were very few, there were, there were still some legal issues on the table and certainly some uh, technical and legal obstacles that Brianna referred to. But most of all, in immigration court at that point, we were there to, to sort of step out of the way as attorneys and give um, Wilmer his voice. And so narrative and storytelling were really at the heart of what we were doing, or what I felt that we were doing there. And um, as a human rights center, a lot of, there's sort of a dual mission, both to advance the law and also to give voice to people who are on the wrong side of a power imbalance. And in this situation, the power imbalance was so stark, with the government kind of marshalling all these resources to detain, to punish, to exile, um, to, to, to say that they had the right to transfer venue from one place to another, that he could be detained in, maybe in Texas, maybe in Louisiana. We didn't know. A few days before he arrived, we didn't know what court he was going to be in. And when he landed, it was news to us that he was going to Louisiana and not staying in Texas. So we had marshaled um, attorneys to assist us in Texas and in Louisiana, and we weren't sure where exactly he was going to be landing. So um, just to bring it back to this human rights and social justice theme, um, being a partner with, with Wilmer was super easy because Wilmer was one of the most diligent of clients I've ever encountered. And we, were, um, we would be on the phone frequently. We emailed multiple times a day. If I suggested that he take pictures of his house to show the, the difficulty in keeping it into a habitable condition, he would take 100 pictures. Um, if I suggested that you know, he find um, and I asked if, is there uh, somebody who, you know, some people who can write letters for you. He would, he, within an hour, I'd get the names and the contact information. Often he was pushing me to get material back to him, um, which is a, an unusual um, posture to be in as an attorney. Oftentimes you're kind of dragging things out of people. So this was indeed very mutual, very collaborative. And at that point, um, I felt that my, that my role as an attorney was in large part to sort of demystify the process of the immigration court, to demystify the power that um, had exerted so much control over him and his life um, and his experience, 
and to give him and sort of to help him see that he had power too. And, um, and he made so many choices about which aspects of his story to share. Um, we ended up sharing, he ended up sharing a piece about his, um, his um, uh, hearing uh, disability, which was something that we didn't actually know about as attorneys for the first seven years of his case. Uh, we didn't, it wasn't a big issue. And we, um, through talking with him, that became something that I think was very powerful to present. So um, that's, that's what I want to say before we pass to Brenton. Thank you, Heather, and thank you all for being here this evening. It's really an honor to share this um, experience with you, and wonderful to meet you, Wilmer. You have been a presence in your absence, uh, or an ever-present <laughs> absence, as some would say, over these many years. And um, I am delighted to celebrate um, what I hope will be a step along the way to many other decisions in this direction. <coughs> And I'm particularly pleased to celebrate it in um, what numbers of you have referred to as a seven-year campaign. Seven is a, a very interesting number. <clears throat> it symbolizes the unity of the four corners of the earth with the Holy Trinity for Christians, but it's also a number in the Quran that has a very special place among Buddhists. And as the Harvard psychologist George Miller commented, most people can only retain seven items of information in their short-term memory of, as, at one time. So Ronaldo graduated in 20, 2007, and we have a graduate from 2017. So in these multiple iterations, seven has appeared and reappeared, and we at the center are celebrating a number of different seventh anniversaries this year. So with the few minutes left, because I know we're all hoping to move to a reception a little after 7 p.m., I'd like to just make um, three points to go. I'm not a lawyer, but um, sometimes psychologists speak in threes also. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge this multidisciplinary team that's collaborated over these many years with Wilmer at its center. As the center of this group, each of the attorneys and the legal aides who've worked on this case have been critical to guiding and advising Wilmer and his family over these years. As importantly, the three experts who you heard briefly about who provided critical medical, economic, and historical information to the case contributed importantly to the decisions that we've been heard about, hearing about today, but also to recognizing that Wilmer would not have been able to secure his human rights to health and well-being in Honduras, as you've heard him describe some of the situation there. Secondly, the stories that Wilmer and his legal team have shared this evening elucidate an important idea which Heather has mentioned, an idea that comes through in much of the work that I have done over the years with transnational and mixed status families in Guatemala and here in the Boston area, and that is the idea of accompaniment or walking alongside each other. As Wilmer has made clear in his story of exile and return, he has worked closely with multiple attorneys and their assistants and you've heard from a number of them. But equally important, as you've also heard from them, Wilmer has accompanied them. You, Wilmer, have risked your life and your well-being in order to test unknown legal waters to convince them that you had been illegally deported and then that you were willing to journey many miles in order to redress an injustice that you had suffered. And your family has been willing to walk alongside you and to walk alongside them. The liberation psychologist and feminist author Mary Watkins uses this term mutual accompaniment to talk about this. And she says that you are mutually accompanying each other towards what she calls the commons to come. That is walking along each, aside each other towards a space and a time that will guarantee us genuine security and a sustainable e ecosystem. She draws from the work of a Mexican activist named Gustavo Esteva who complements these ideas by writing about what he calls a pending transformation in the world in which we live, or what he calls the commoning in a new society. And he describes it as something that goes beyond development, beyond globalization, and marginalizes and limits the economic sphere that reestablished politics and ethics at the center of social life, and reclaims what he calls comunidad, which he assumes will be a new political horizon of radical pluralism to create a world which, in his words, is one that we can embrace and that represents a participatory democracy in which we are all involved in that transformation. The Center for Human Rights, as you've also heard from a number of people, 
has been hoping to work in exactly these kinds of cases towards transformative change, a change that will reclaim comunalidad in which we can address an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary teams to train a new generation, and this represents that new generation. It's extraordinarily exciting to be here with people who were at the center when the center got started and who are doing the kind of important work that we've heard about today, because this is the new generation of scholars and practitioners that we were hoping that the center would be a small part of facilitating. So tonight we celebrate this critical accomplishment in the center's decade-long history towards communing towards a new society one that's more just and more equitable. We thank you for being with us, Wilmer. We thank your family for being with us. And we thank all of you for being here tonight. And we hope a little after 7 that we'll be able to share some drink and food to celebrate. <laughs> So I wanted to know a little bit more about the immigration judge hearing when it happened, because many, several of my students are in the room here. They've had experiences with immigration judges. There's, they have an exploding docket and way too many cases and hardly enough time to listen to what it is you have to say. And it, you had a lot to say. You had thousands of photos. You had, you know, I can only imagine how many pages that filing must have been. Um, so did you feel like, and obviously the result was good, but did you feel like you got the fair hearing that you expected going into it after all the work that had been done to get that hearing? Um, no, of course not. Of course I, that was not even a setup. I didn't really know the answer oh, to that. you didn't? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I mean, just personally speaking, I mean, I think that there were three attorneys. Um, the lead attorney for the, for the cancellation case is actually not here tonight. We did a lot of the legwork. She was going to present the case, Danielle. And um, we were nervous. We were preparing. Um, we were preparing closing arguments. We were you know, doing final touches with all of our experts and our many, many witnesses um, who are here today. We had lots of people uh, lined up to speak. and. Um, it is a little bit, it does feel a little bit baffling and a little bit, there does seem to be a bit of a lack of due process to not really understand what, what was it that convinced the judge. We have no idea. I mean, his answer, his, he just checked yes. off a box, it's handed simple. us a piece of paper, <laughs> gave us a smile, and we were off. But um, <laughs> we did submit, you know, uh, over the course of years, um, quite a lot of material about the equities in, uh, in Wilmer's situation. And although the same judge had looked at this case in 2014, um, in the guy, it was a, a different procedural posture, so he was trying, he was, he was uh, at that point um, commenting on whether the case could be won uh, rather than whether it would be granted. And he would, had made very, very favorable findings at that point. So I think that, um, of course, when we, we didn't know until a couple, like a month or two before, that it was going to be that same judge. So when we were preparing that enormous filing, we didn't know if the judge was even going to look at what had been done before, or had any, and we had, we did not assume any familiarity with, this, with the facts of the case. So yes, um, as somebody who put all of this work <laughs> into drawing out this story, it did feel a little flat to not to not know what the judge was thinking and what he had been convinced by. But um, <laughs> that said, I'll take it. <laughs> I, think he, I think we wore him down. I, I don't think he wanted to see any, any other members of this team again. And it's an old principle. You can live without due process if you're going to win, you know? <laughs> <coughs> Oh, yeah. That's, That's Rachel. Rachel. Hello. That's, everyone. That's Rachel. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. Rachel was the first person we hired for this project. 
many, many years ago. She actually hired us. Not that many. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, well, your story is so inspiring, Wilmar, and uh, I'm, I can't wait to read your book. And I'm wondering um, if you are, uh, Mary kind of asked if you were comfortable having your name on this case, but I'm also wondering, are you interested in kind of being a public spokesperson at a time when people have so many misconceptions about immigrants and immigrants are being demonized so much and um, and I'm, I'm, I, it's a hard thing to choose personally, right? Because you sort of expose yourself to all kinds of things and you give up your, your privacy. But I'm wondering if, if that's part of the idea of writing the book is to, to be a uh, kind of a public voice on these issues. I'm very com uh, <laughs> It will be a honor to do so. This, this was a point that we, that, that we, as I said, we're, I'm a, we're lawyers and we're worriers. So we've been uh, checking in with him over and over again. Do you want your name on the poster? Do we, should we send out the press release? Should your name be on the press release? Do you want media here? He says, Where's CNN? Uh, no. and, and he's giving me, he's giving us some media tips. He was, yeah, he, I think, I mean, my understanding, Wilmer, is that you want your story to inspire and to inspire others and to change other people's lives. Exactly. That's what I want. And so he, he's, and uh, he said, uh, I think the, the, the exact quote was, the haters will hate. <laughs> there you go. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> One more? What's the best thing about being back? <laughs> What's the best thing about being back? The best thing about being back is my family, that love that you feel. You grew up with your parents, and you know, after being for so many years away from them, I know as parents, they suffer a lot. Just imagine having your younger son deported, and you can't do anything about it. And being back, it just, I remember my, my dad used to say, you know, if, if you ever be able to come back, it, it will be like winning the lottery to me. Mm. And, I, and I told him, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could I ask that, that Wilmer's family stand up and just be recognized for a second? Would you mind just standing up so we can recognize you? They came, they came from Louisiana and Florida in the middle of February with snow on the ground. <laughs> and, that, and they've traveled um, this, this long journey with him. Well, I don't think there could be any greater reward, as you've heard, than our luck in being able to participate in this, in this long journey. But uh, as a center, we thought that Nixon Peabody in particular should get some special recognition. And so we're giving to the firm of Nixon Peabody our first Human Rights in Action Award, which comes with a wooden plaque and no money, but our eternal gratitude and, and we don't have Judy Garland ruby slippers mugs, but what do we have? Uh, oh, post-deportation <laughs> human rights mugs for Ronaldo. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have too many BC mugs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Brianna. Brianna? Brianna? <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Perfect. Drink oh, well. in good health. Yeah.
Um, we have one for Danielle McLaughlin, who's been mentioned here, and, and I wish she could have been here because she was really a crucial member of our team, uh, even though she was occasionally appearing on Fox News as we were <laughs> and in this case of Wilmer saying, where's CNN? And there's Danielle on Fox, but that's another story. Anyway, we have a mug for her. We have a beautiful mug for Jessica. Where are you? <laughs>